Hey guys, how are we? We're back again with The Untold Truth. I hope everybody had a great week last week. I'm so thankful for the people who reached out to me after I released the, first, the part one to The Untold Truth. I've had so many people reach out to me just for advice, tell me their story. Um, and I can't be more grateful because that's what I really wanted to do with this is I wanted to bring people in and you know, we can only keep what we have by giving it away. Um, those of you that are in the rooms, that's a, you know, you know, that's one of the sayings and I love it. Um, so I just want to start off by saying thank you to the ones who shared my story and shared my video and, and thank you. Thank you so much. Um, everybody has been so supportive, so great. I can't thank you enough. Um, I hope everybody had a great last week. Mine went pretty good. It went really fast, which is what we love. We love when the week goes by fast, gets, gets us quicker to the weekend. Um, so I want to pick up where we left off, which was just, we were at September the 22nd, 2023, the day before David had stabbed me. I, and in my last video, we had stopped with, I dropped him off at CSU. Um, me and my family friend, we had dropped David off and he was going to go get help. Uh, and at this point on our way back we had got back to my family friend's house where I was staying the night and I had laid down and I was laying there and I was thinking to myself you know what am I going to do am I going to stay with him he's trying to get help so maybe I should stay with him and supporting because we know how it can feel when you go and try to get help and you come back and nobody's there you know everybody's gone because you burned all those bridges um so i didn't want him to come back to nothing and at this point i still loved david you know i still loved him um and yes i am using the real name because it was on the headlines it's been in the news so that's why i'm using his name you know um uh, because I know uh, last week somebody had commented about that, asking if I was able to. Yes, I am, because my story's been in the news. It's been everywhere. Um, so, back to what I was saying. Sorry, guys. Uh, I still had love for David. You know, I still was still in love with this man. I was pulling away, like I said, because he was getting more abusive and was using and I couldn't handle it. I couldn't go to school, work, do hair on the side, and and handle being beat and abused, and I needed to protect myself. So we were living separately. Um, and with that being said, you know, so I'm laying there and I'm thinking to myself, am I going to stay with him? What am I going to do? You know, as if he gets because remind you, I've been with David sober, and he was. The best husband I could ask for. You know, he didn't even raise his voice at me. He didn't, he barely spoke. The man is amazing, especially when he's sober. I mean, he is amazing. Um, so I'm laying there and I'm thinking to myself, okay, if he continues through with this and he gets help, I'll stay. And I finally think to myself, thank goodness, you know, he's getting help. Thank goodness. This is it. He's going to get help, you know? And so, um, 7 a.m. rolls around and David calls me and he says, I'm at the door. Can you let me in? And I said, well, yeah, sure. And he comes in and I say, well, what's going on? And he said, well, they want me to go to the addiction side. But I wanted to talk to you first because I, I didn't want to just disappear for a long time and not know if you're going to stick by me and what we're going to do. And um, also, he said, I'm not sure if I want to do that or go to a Christian place. And I said, well... I really want to think this through with you. I want to plan it out if you're going to go get help. And so um, I said, can we lay down for about an hour or so? Because I have to meet with my sponsor and then I have to work. And I also um, I have to do hair. And I want to make sure that we think this through. And he said, yeah, sure. So we lay down. We lay down for about an hour or so. And I get up and it's about 840. I, I shoot up off the bed and I said, oh, my gosh. I'm supposed to meet my sponsor, um, and David says, okay, well, that's okay, we can, we can go, we, uh, well, I'll take you to meet him, and I 
stuff and I say, no, I'll reschedule. Because remind you, I'm very, very vigilant at this point. Um, and remember the night before, I was in the car with David and David tried to choke me out. So I, I knew better than to get in the car alone with him one-on-one -on -one again. It's not gonna happen, you know? Um, so I said, no, 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 no. I, I declined very politely and I said, no, uh, I'll just reschedule, he'll understand. I said, and then that gives us time to decide what you wanna do. And I said, because I don't want you to just run off and not have clothes or anything like that. I want us to do this properly, you know? Because David had a really bad habit of just upping and going to the hospitals and committing itself and, and without any planning and I know what it's like to be in rehab I'm in recovery myself remember I told you all that in my first video I'm in recovery myself and so I didn't want him to just uh, I've been to rehab sorry jumping here I've been to rehab so I didn't want him to just go and go with no clothes and no money for a vape or cigarettes or anything like that I wanted him to be smart about this you know and and know that I was going to be there as long as he got help as long as he got help um, so he said, okay, well, okay. And so this was about nine o'clock. And so we decided we were going to go out on the porch and we were going to hit our vapes and he was going to smoke a cigarette and we were going to talk. And my family friend was in the living room. Everybody was awake. Um, and we were out on the porch and we were talking and um, here's another thing too. I want to jump back to this real quick. I, I had to condition myself to be very alert at all times and be very aware and observant to what David I was dealing with. Was it hi David, coming down David, demon David? Who is it that I'm dealing with? Because I have to be careful about what I say because triggered, he's going to fly mad. And so I guess you could say I was in survival mode immediately. From the moment that David came back that morning and I had heard that David had went to friends of ours the night before and when he had left CSU and was talking to them and telling them that he felt like I was about to divorce him and I was gonna leave him and he didn't know what to do. And he was very upset about it, apparently. You know, uh, that's hearsay. I don't know if it's true, I don't know for sure. But that's what I've heard. So David had already felt like I was gonna leave, which let's back up here. I was distancing myself and putting space between us because I couldn't handle the abuse. I grew up in a very dysfunctional family where abuse was a thing and I refused to put up with it today, is what I thought until I was brainwashed really heavily and told I'll change, I'm sorry. Um, and me as a naturally forgiving person and at the time maybe even gullible and vulnerable, I was very vulnerable too at the time because you know, in my head, nobody's gonna want me, I'm already a mess, I'm damaged, I'm not enough, my own husband doesn't want me, so who would want me? You know, all those thoughts, all those feelings. So I was very vulnerable and in survival mode, okay? I guess you could say. Um, we're on the porch and we're having a conversation about what we're gonna do and what the day consists of. Uh, I had to work at 12 o'clock. Um, I had to do hair. Um, and now I have the David situation. What are we going to do with David?
because I want him to get help because I want to, st at this point, I still want to be with him. I'm still in love with him. We're married. And I took married marriage very seriously. And I'll tell you, I... I know, I knew David's potential, you know, and, and that's what I saw all the time. And I did believe that he would, he would get help and he would go and do whatever he had to do to get back to normal. And I can't stand here today or sit here today and say I hate him and all these things, you know, because I don't, I don't hate him. I still have love for him. You know, when the attack occurred, it didn't, it was just like any other time that he had beaten me. It didn't take my love away from him. At all. Um, and here's another thing, you know, I can't see here today and say I don't forgive him. Because I had to forgive him. Right away, immediately. I knew because I'm in recovery. I've worked the programs. I've worked the steps. I know. Forgiveness is mandatory and knowing the parts that you play knowing the parts that you play you know do you know how to forgive somebody uh you look at whatever's going on and you say well what part did i play and what part did they play and then that's how you come to a medium you know um and i'll tell you what uh You, you can hold on at being angry at somebody as long as you want. You sure can, for as long as you want. But it's going to come out in so many ways. Ways that you won't even believe. You know, and you can say, I'm not angry at them anymore. I don't even care anymore. I don't care. Yes, you do. And I'll tell you how you figure it out. When it starts coming out in your character, when integrity starts going out the window, when you can't be there for your friends, when you can't even hold a simple appointment, when you're late to events and school and work and anything else that you've got going on, when it feels like it's gonna take an act of Congress just to get up and take a shower, when you start realizing that you're super defensive every time someone says something, they could be talking about their Aunt Joanne that lives in Arkansas and you take it immediately that it's about you. That's how these things come out. That's how, that's how it starts coming out. Um, you know, you, you have, you have to forgive. And I'm still bitter at times. I feel like it's a grief thing. I feel like I'm grieving my marriage. I'm grieving losing him. I'm grieving um, a lot of different times. I see myself, I'll be okay. And then I'm just, I'll get angry for no reason. It's because I'm still healing, you know, mentally, physically, and emotionally. Um, when it comes down to it, I can't sit here and say, like I said, that I don't have love for the man still because I do love him. And even when all of this took place, I told the detectives and the DA, I said, I'll do whatever I have to do to comply, but I'm not going out of my way to make anything worse. I'm not doing that. You know, I want to do what I got to do and move forward because I know that a lot of the character defects that I saw in David was addiction. You know, the drugs aren't the problem. We are. The disease of addiction is a problem. You know, and I know that. So this situation was very, very hard for me to just walk away from and 
I know that sounds insane for me to say, and I hear myself saying it and it sounds insane, but it's because I, I walked those shoes of addiction, you know, and I've been in active addiction. I understand it, I get it. But I also know how important it is to not just get sober, not to just stop doing the drugs, but to live clean. You have to live clean and you have to do the work. It's not going to go away. None of this stuff inside of you is going to go away. You will end up using it again. Um, okay, so we let's get back to, it's about nine, I guess it was about 9.30 or so at this point. And David and I are sitting on the porch and we're talking. And he says to me, this is when I knew what David I was talking to immediately. He looks up at the camera that was on the porch and he said, I don't know why you're so scared of me. I've never been physically abusive to you. And I said, huh? And I said, we're not talking about all that right now. That's not what we're talking about. I said, we're trying to decide what we're going to do. And I knew immediately. And I'll tell you, there's a couple different ways that I knew that David had used or he was coming down. One, because my body got to the point when I was in that relationship, in that marriage, to the point of I would get chills, my pupils would dilate, I would start sweating. Every time I knew that David wasn't himself when he was about to get violent. And I knew immediately because I got chills and my insides just started shaking. That's one of the ways. The other way is because when the lights are on and nobody's home with David, his eyes just are blank. They're blank, they're blank completely blank and I'm looking at him and I'm thinking to myself God I can't do this today I can't do this today I can't do this today and David looks at me and he says do you think I'm crazy and I said no I just think that you're gonna have to get the addiction under control and you're gonna maybe get your meds back on your meds or get them situated because remember I told you David had BPD and David had quit taking his meds when we were planning on moving to Colorado and it was a little rough for him at first but he seemed to have come around but then again David was not when he was sober he wasn't a talker he wasn't somebody that wanted to express his feelings and really get ooey gooey and he's a he's a man you know most men we shut down like that we don't and I'm still even though I'm real feminine I still am like that at times I don't like hugs I think they're ick. My sister, it's so funny, my sister Jessica always tells me, you are so weirded out by hugs, that you're the weirdest hugger. And I think it's hilarious because I feel like that's like the guy side of me coming out, you know, when it comes down to it, even though I'm real feminine. Um, and so, then David goes inside and I'm sitting there and I'm, th I'm thinking to myself, what? What's gonna happen today? Like, what are, what are, you, what are we gonna do? And I do think at this point in my um, relationship, I was, I was angry because I wanted this David that was, that I knew when he was sober. I wanted that David back because I wasn't ready to let go. I wasn't ready to let go. I wanted to love him but I wanted us to do it very happily and healthily, healthily, healthy, happy and healthy. <laughs> you know, and I feel like a lot of this grief comes out and, and I have to, I have to laugh or I'll cry, you know, and that's just part of it. Um, 
and I can see my healing in so many different ways. I see it all the time. I see when I'm grieving and I, and I see it by the way that I'm acting or the way that I'm, because you know, I, um, I didn't, I made it, I'm alive. And that's number one out of 1% chance to live. And I made it. And I'll tell you what, I didn't walk out it with no walk out with no scars and no bruises or no I still have issues today. You know, I a little TMI, but I have issues going to the restroom. I um I've had a bowel obstruction since then. I've um I have stomach issues. I still get sick every day. You know, I have to adapt and get my body back to normal. Restless legs where I have nerve damage. Um, there's still a lot for me to be angry about. And every time these things happen, I want to be angry. But I have to remind myself, no, 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 no. We're not going to get angry and bitter. Because that's not just going to hurt me. But it hurts everybody around me. Because I start acting out and being grumpy and being over the edge and can't show up and show out and fill anybody else's cup because I'm, I want to sit and be angry. And I can't be like that. And I have to be very conscious of that every single moment of every day. Um, I have a lot of triggers today. There's a lot of different triggers. Um, one, um, that I can tell you right off the bat, if somebody raises their voice to me, I automatically assume they're going to get violent. They're going to get physical. Um, after, I guess about a week or so, after all this had happened, I was at a store. I was at a Ross, and I was shopping. And um, there was a lady in the store, and I could tell that she was maybe using maybe an active addiction maybe recently uh had used something like that or coming down or something and she was standing behind me and i had things in my hand standing at the register and she said it's so hot in here it makes me want to be violent and immediately my world slowed down it felt like i started i felt one drop of sweat trickle down my head that's how slow it slowed down. I grabbed my things. I set them on the register up there, the the uh, where the register was, and I walked out and I got in my car. I turned the car on. It's pouring rain, really loud. The windshield wipers were on, so they were being very loud. And instantly, I was overstimulated, and I instantly just started crying. And I said, "Whoa." About a few minutes goes by, I pull myself together and I'm like, wow. Because see, in the beginning when all this had happened and I just got out of the hospital, I didn't have a lot of PTSD yet. There wasn't a lot going on for me to have PTSD, but I was also in a calm environment at the time upstairs with my grandmother and she's older, so she was very calm and it was very quiet. Um, I didn't have a lot of things going on but as I knew little things like uh, going outside in the dark I don't I couldn't do it my grandmother would send me to go get my brother and I would she would watch watch me as she was as I would get in the car because uh, I was scared um, I was scared that David was gonna bond out and he was gonna get him to my grandmother's or something and hurt me um, I was scared that I was going to run into somebody that he knew and I knew and they were going to ask me about the situation and I wasn't ready to talk about it just yet. Um, I, I was scared that I was going to start having nightmares. Luckily, still to this day, I've only had three nightmares of the situation itself. Um, I do notice that when they, when I do have them that next day, it really throws me off and I get very shaky and nervous and my anxiety's up to here and I'm very short and I catch myself wanting to withdraw and those days I just want to crawl in a hole and I just want to hide. Um, so 
you know, there's a lot of different triggers today for me as well. If I know that somebody is using drugs or I know that they are messed up, I immediately get chills, I'm nervous, um, I can't tolerate it and I have to remove myself from the situation immediately because I get shaken up. Even if I get in a disagreement with someone today, whether it's words, if it's just a conversation, I get nervous immediately. Um, and it's hard for me to deal with what's going on at that moment. Um, it's like I freeze up, you know, and that is PTSD. Hazel. Um, that is PTSD. Um, and it gets really hard for me just to live everyday life to the point of I, I'm zoned in on every move that I make, you know? Um, and I'm very vigilant with who I allow around me today, with my inner circle, with what I say, what I do, because if I had someone around me today that it's very just all over the place and buck wild and loud and obnoxious and, and very reckless, I don't think I would be able to handle it. Um, so I'm very closed off. Um, and unfortunately, I feel like that'll fade. I am in therapy. You know, I, I told you guys in the first video, I'm in three different therapies. One of them is amazing. And the other two are just kind of like groups. Um, but they are amazing. Um, and they do help, but this takes time. You know, and every day I learn something new about myself. I see myself progressing. And every day I get a little stronger, you know, that's cliche, but it's the truth. Um, sometimes at night I catch myself getting very, I don't like being alone, you know. Um, and I can tell when I'm like emotionally and uh, mentally like overstimulated, I guess you could say, because on those days I'll come home and I can't even, I'll turn my TV on and it'll be on for five minutes and I'm out, you know, like that. Um, and so this recovery process has been draining, but beautiful because at the same time, even though I'm having to clean up this mess, that I didn't create myself, some of it, you know, some of it, this was just because I'm coming out of survival mode. I was in survival mode for a year and a half. And, you know, there's still beautiful things that have came from this. Um, one of which, the people that have reached out to me and, and said, just hearing your story, it, allowed, it gave me the strength to stand up and walk away and choose me. And just hearing that, makes it worth it to me. Yes, I wish I'd never had to go through it, but I am glad I made it. You know, 1% and I I made it. Me and God, we did this. You know, he, he has me here for a reason and I believe it. And I do believe that it's to tell my story and to change the world and save some lives, maybe one person at a time, you know? Um, and I'll tell you, it's a beautiful journey. It is, and I'm just grateful I'm able to be here and share this with you, but okay, let me jump back to where I was at. Um, it's about 9.40, and he had just asked me if I thought he was crazy, and I said, no, I do think that your meds need adjusted, and you do need to um, maybe get, get some some um, rehab and stuff like that. Just, you need to be happy and healthy because we can't do this if you're not. David goes inside and he comes back out of the house and he says, so you don't think I'm crazy? And at this time I'm sitting in a chair and he's standing in front of me. And I said, no. And before I could even finish and repeat what I had said, David starts stabbing me violently. And all I can remember thinking at this moment is, he's gonna kill me. 
And so all I said was, he's stabbing me. And I didn't scream it, I didn't, not very loud. And then I immediately start counting in my head that how many times he was stabbing me. I don't know why, but that's just how my body took over. That's how, that's how it, it went down. Um, and, you know, my family friend's grandson comes out and at this point, he opens the door, David sees him, and my family friend's grandson tosses David off the porch. David's standing in the yard and I get up and immediately I get up and I guess the adrenaline in my body is what got me up. I stood up completely and I look over and David is screaming something and then he jumps in the car and he leaves. Um, and I'll tell you later on what he was, what he had been screaming, uh, because I did find out by the DA. Um, and so I run in the house and my family friend is screaming. She's like, oh my God, he's cut you. And I was screaming, don't call 911 because I was trying to say, just give me a moment to get it together because I had a fear of ambulances. And I will tell you at this point, I'm just like, panicked i'm freaked out because i know i'm gonna have to be in that ambulance all i wanted was my mom at this moment all i wanted was my dad at this moment or someone that i could trust and at this moment i'm feeling completely scared and i mean over the top scared and i just remember i was wearing a white t-shirt and i think some sweatpants possibly and i remember thinking to myself i looked down and there's just blood everywhere and I look forward and there's this blood coming down my face. And all I can remember thinking is, <laughs> what the heck just happened? You know what I mean? Like, this is it, he's done for. You know, this is it, like what? Now, because remember in the first video, I told you I never wanted to call the cops or make press charges because I didn't want him to ruin his record. I didn't want David to mess up his life because a lot of us in recovery have been through the justice system and it is hard once you get in it to get out. And it's just like, you don't, you don't want that. And I was trying to think about that for him. And so all I can remember thinking at these moments are it's done, you know, it's over. You know, I can't save him now. What is, what the hell? And so the all I remember also is here or then I remember here in the ambulance and this officer comes to the door or I know he doesn't come to the door I meet him on the porch I get up and run when I hear the ambulance pull in because I I knew that I needed help because I couldn't breathe he had hit my lung um my abdominal aorta and anybody who knows a little bit about the body or medical in the medical field your aorta it will you're done if they slice it you're done at least you're supposed to be but god's bigger than any science god is bigger than anything and i'll tell you he hit my abdominal aorta i was stabbed 27 times um one of which being on my neck one the knife in went in right here and went out back here um, let's see what side it's on. Right here, stab me in my eye, stab me in the top of my head right here, stab me in my trach. Um, he stabbed me in my hand. Let me see if I can get you guys, I don't want to get like banned, I don't know, but. Stab me in my chest, stab me in my breast, stab me right here, stab me over here, stab me over here, stab me up here, stab me in here, stabbed me here, stabbed me in my back on this side. I don't know if you guys can see it. And then also the scar goes down and it goes almost to my private. Um, and there was more stabs on me, uh, some of which, this one, he stabbed me right here. I don't know if you can see it right there. Stabbed me right here. These are defense wounds where I was trying to stop him because I didn't know if he was gonna start hitting me. Um, up here, the knife broke, thank God, or no, the knife broke in my rib, I think. Thank God, because then he started stabbing me in my face and in my head, and if the knife hadn't broke, he would have stabbed me straight through my brain. And 
So the police officer, as I get to the porch, there's a police officer standing there and he's trying to stick these gauze on me. And he's like, sit down, sit down, because I'm trying to get to the ambulance because I couldn't breathe and I needed oxygen and I knew that. So he's like, sit down, sit down. He's trying to stick these gauze on me. And he's like, what happened? And I'm like, I just got stabbed by who? My husband. And the officer looks at me. And you could tell he was just shocked. You know, you're shocked. He's, he doesn't know what to do. The ambulance, the paramedic comes out. And I'm like, can I walk to the paramedic's bed? I said, I have to go. I, have to, I cannot breathe. And he said, yes. So I go. They put me on the gurney and I'm screaming at my family friend, please come with me, please come with me, please come with me because I'm scared to death of this ambulance. And I didn't know what was gonna happen. So we get to the ambulance, she has to stay because he's like, I need to question you. And I need to question the people who was here so they stay. And I get in the ambulance and from back when I used to get in trouble and go to jail and stuff like that, back in my active addiction, I knew the paramedic, he used to be a CO. And he was talking to me and he said, Cody, what happened? I need you to stay with me. And he's trying to keep me attentive, trying to keep me attentive, answering questions. Because at this point, we don't know where all David had got. He was asking me what I felt. And I, I said, I, when things calm down and I'm in the ambulance, and they get me an IV in me. I said, can you please give me some pain meds? I'm in so much pain. And he said, absolutely. Give me a moment and I will get you going. But I need you to stay with me. So he's talking to me. And all I can remember thinking is I'm going in and out. You know, like I'm like, am I dying? Am I going to die? What is going on? You know, and the Hazel, lay down. I'm like... Sorry, my dog, she's in the crate. So every, um, she's very ADHD like me. She don't sit still very long. But um, I remember asking the paramedic, you know, where are you taking me? Are you taking me to lab? And he said, no. And I said, thank God. He, or he said, do you want to die? And I said, no. And he said, I'm taking you to UT. And I said, okay. And I can hear on the radio on the paramedics radio, I remember hearing, I remember hearing, we're shutting down Highway 95, we're shutting down this, we're shutting down this. The attacker is at large, he's running, he's not been caught yet. He took off. So after David stabs me, he jumps in the car and he takes off. And he, apparently tries to jump off a bridge which i didn't know this until um after like five days when i finally woke up out of the coma and stuff and had came to is when i found out that he had tried to jump off a bridge um we make it to ut and i remember falling out in the ambulance and what coming to when we're going through the doors of UT and I just remember this lady on a gurney and then I remember we get through the doors and they're saying victim has stab wounds we don't know how many we don't know the severity of them I've had him on oxygen I gave him some pain medicine I get into the doors and it's like something you would see on Grey's Anatomy or a movie a swarm of nurses doctors and surgeons come to me and they get me they transport me to a bed they take me in this room, and next thing I know, the surgeon says, Cody, you're, he said, I'm going to put you out in three, two, one, and I'm gone. And throughout this, I can remember waking up one time, and this nurse was standing there, and I kept saying I wanted to write, like I was doing this, I wanted to write, because they had a tube down my throat. They had me on a ventilator um, and she said, no, you can't. Well, I grabbed the Sharpie from her badge thing and she said, okay, okay, I'll get you paper. So she got me paper and I wrote, where's David? And she said, in jail, if that's the one who's, if that's your husband that you're talking about who stabbed you. And I said, I just looked at her and then I said, am I safe? And she said, yes, you're safe. And I fell back out. 
and I was unconscious for about five days. They had me out. Um, at this time, they're trying to get a hold of my sister in the beginning because they were telling her he's got a 1% chance survival. Do you want us to do this surgery or not? There was like a surgery that they were going to try to do and hopefully it worked because nobody's ever made it out of this particular trauma. When the, um, when you get stabbed in, in your aorta or your abdominal aorta and they had to do surgery, nobody's ever made it off the table is what I was told. And, um, so my sister, she, my whole family's rushed there. I'm not sure how everybody heard about it. I'm not sure who called who, how it came about. I'm not sure about all that. Um, and it will be neat to kind of put that on the podcast because I'm going to get to hear it for the first time too. So I'll share that with you guys as we interview everybody who was a part of this. Um, my sister, Sam, is the one who had to call the shots at the moment immediately. And my sister said yes whatever you got to do let's do it and they said well there's a one percent survival rate or one percent chance that he'll survive through this and she said i don't care then what do we have to lose let's do it so immediately we get they start surgery on me and the surgeon um that did the surgery she's like 28 years old you know and i'm 29 and i couldn't imagine doing what she does i could not I had three different surgical teams, I think, and I also had a bunch of nurses, um, and they all worked together, and they started this surgery, I think it was 10 hours the first day, and then they put me in this room, they said, they told my family, if you want to go back and see him, you can, he's probably not going to make it through the night, and so my family is coming back there, and they're seeing me, they're viewing me, they're sad, they're crying, and they had me open. They still had me open, laying on the table, about there, laying in the room, I guess. Um, and they had these stomach vats on me where they had been doing surgery. I lost, they gave me nine two liters of blood because I'd lost so much blood. Um, and oh, my, um, one of my good friend's mom actually set up a blood drive to get back the blood that they had gave me, which I thought was really, really amazing. A, a lot of my friends and family just pulled through and were so great through this and so supportive. And I don't know where I would have been without them because if I'd have woke up in that hospital and I'd have been alone with nobody, because remind you, in an abusive relationship, you push everybody away. You end up to where it's just you and him, which is exactly where your abuser wants you to be. That's perfect for him. It's perfect for him when you're like that. Because he can pull you away from your family and friends. And and then it's easier to control you because nobody's talking to you, putting stuff in your head, trying to give you the courage, build you up. And that's, that's the truth. That is so true. That's nothing but the truth. You know? Um, but my family and stuff was all uh, amazing through all this. But... We're at the hospital, and during the stay, they had ended up um, overnight. I came to quit. I came to, and um, the or the doctors came in the next morning, and they said he's still alive, and he's doing okay. Do you want us to go back in and start surgery again? And my sister said absolutely. So they did, and they had done a abdominal aorta repair. They repaired my lung. Uh, I think they took a piece of my lung, actually. They took my gallbladder out. They had to work on my kidney. They had to work on my um, liver. And I think that was it. I think there, there might have been a couple other. I will double check over my paperwork and let y'all know if that's something you're interested in. Um, I feel like every detail in this is very, very important because once I tell you everything that had happened to me during this, there is no other, there is no explanation that I'm here or the reason for me being here except God. And that's the truth. That's the truth. And if you don't believe in God, that's cool too. Uh, but if you believe in a power greater than yourself, then whatever that is, obviously had me here for a reason. Um, and I'll tell you, so 
they wanted me, they were talking about me going to, just a moment, going to a rehabilitation center because they didn't know if I was gonna have brain damage. They didn't know if I was gonna be able to walk or talk or function. We didn't know. We didn't know right away because the doctors and surgeons couldn't even believe I was alive. They're standing there looking at my family like, we don't know. He's here, we, he's alive, he made it. But we don't know why and we don't know how. We just did what we could to repair what we could. So, that's why I say, that's why I say it's such a beautiful and, and it's such a beautiful tragedy. Yes, I lost my marriage and I'm getting, or I'm divorced and I'm going through all this, but I believe in God more than ever today. I believe, I believe. And I feel like we all struggle with faith. And you know, they have that same faith without works is dead. God showed up and showed out on me. And, and I do believe that Whatever my purpose is here, I'm gonna fulfill it. Because I would be silly not to. And I do believe that it's something in the field of maybe helping other people with addicts or people with domestic violence, domestic abuse relationships. Um, so they wanted me to, they thought, I, they didn't know I was gonna go on, but as time, came on, came, as time went on and I was in the hospital nine days. Um, I woke up on the fifth day. I grabbed my phone, my aunt's phone, who was in the room, and I said, I want a nicotine patch, you know. Um, so she goes out there and she tells the nurse, because at this point I still have a tube in my throat. So, the on the life support. So, she goes out there and tells the nurse, um, hey, he's texting saying he's wanting a nicotine patch. And the nurse said, okay, let me reach out to the doctor and see I'm sure we can get that done. So the nurse reaches out to the doctor and says, hey, our patient's texting saying he wants a nicotine patch. And he said, oh yeah, that's fine. And then he calls back and he says, did you say that the patient was texting? And she said, yeah. And he said, take him off life support. Get that tube out of him. So they come in there and they take the tube out of me. I still have these drains on me. I still have a lung tube in my back. Um, I still have IVs all in me. I had an IV in my neck. I had one in my arm, one in this arm. Um, and I, um, I'm starving to death at this point, I feel like anyways, but I really wasn't because they had me on IV of uh, vitamins and nutrients and things that I needed, but I couldn't eat. So, little by little, as the days went by, I was only in the hospital nine days, this is the fifth day I woke up. As the days go by, I slowly, every day we start getting able for me to eat. The first time I ate, I threw up completely everywhere and it looked like the exorcism there. I threw up on myself, all over the floor, all over the bed. It was disgusting and it was because I had not had any of the food that I'd been eating and I'd been knocked out and they'd been giving me um, food through the tube and then also, um, I don't my gallbladder taken out. And you do not go straight to eating grease or anything like that. You have to be on a very, very low sodium diet, very bland because, oh my gosh, your body has to get used to it, uh, not having your gallbladder. So the days go by and I get my catheter taken out. I get my lung tube taken out. I get my... I get my IVs, or I get the stomach drains taken out, and I get my IVs out. And I'm telling the doctors, I don't want to be in here long. I got to get back to school and work. And and they're like, well, just calm down and, and let's see how you do. So every day I, I get better. Every day I get more and more better. And 
about the ninth day and my nurses were so sweet. They moved me out of ICU on the sixth day, sixth or seventh day, and they put me down to a regular room. And I think I was in there for a couple days and then I was able to go home. And my nurses were absolutely amazing at UT. They were the sweetest. They would get up and let me walk around and take me downstairs because I'm a go person. I don't like to be tied down. I don't like to be trapped. I like to go. Um, and I was having a lot of bowel problems, so I needed to be up and moving and all that good junk. And my friends and family were all there and it supported me. I got so many vases of flowers. I got cards, everybody. I got clothes. I got these little cute socks things that my family had got me. Um, and we were all trying to decide where I was going to go, what I was going to do. And my grandmother said, I want him to come to my house. I was suggested to go somewhere a little bit further away for at least a few days to see what was gonna happen with David, if he was gonna bond out or what was gonna happen with that. And said so that if he got out, he wouldn't come to, my, to me, you know, or try to find me right away because we had figured he would try to reach out or find me right away. So um, I go to stay with a very good friend of mine for a couple days and then I go back to my grandmother's or I went to my best friend's house and then I went to my grandmother's and during this time I wasn't having a lot of triggers or wasn't having a lot of PTSD I only remember one time in the hospital that I woke up in the middle of the night instantly scared in a panic in a panic because I was scared David was gonna get out and show up at the hospital and they wasn't gonna know what he looked like or they weren't gonna know who he was and he was gonna come up and get to me and do something crazy because why wouldn't he at this point? He already tried to kill me and didn't, so why wouldn't he finish the job if he, could, if he got out and had the opportunity? You know, so I woke up in a panic, and but I get out and I'm doing okay. I'm struggling with, the, with my body, still getting used to things. I was throwing up and I was very miserable for a few days, you know, um, for a couple weeks actually. And about a week goes by and my dad dies. And that, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to feel because at this point, at this point I'm completely alone, you know, in my mind. Like I have no parents now, what am I gonna do? Um, there was flowers sent to the funeral and these flowers were white roses and sunflowers and those are my two favorite flowers and one person knows that and his name was David. So David had had his family send me and here's the thing, the flowers didn't have a from, they just had a to Cody Ellis and they said Ellis. So my aunt comes out the funeral home of, at my dad's funeral and she said, here, these were addressed to you. And I'm like, huh, weird. And I freeze because immediately I turn around and I see the flowers and I see what kind they are. And I'm like, wow. You know, I knew immediately. I knew immediately. Um, and so that's, same week, I think it was, I was having some stomach issues and I, <laughs> I drank Epsom salt mixed with a little bit of water because back in the day you could do that and it would help you use the restroom. Well, you're not supposed to drink eight ounces of it. I'll tell you that. And so I poisoned myself and uh, one of my good friends came over and he said, I think you need to call poison control. So we call poison control and at this point, that day I was, oh my gosh, I was so miserable. I was hurting so bad. That night before I had my knees to my chest laying in the bed, like, God, please, if, if that didn't take me out, that stabbing didn't take me out, this is going to. And so I called poison control, let them know what I did. I explained to them that I'd just been stabbed 27 times a week before. And they're like, what? Go to the hospital. So I go to the hospital and I'm in there for about five hours. And they come back and they tell me, the doctor says, well, there's a really high level of magnesium in you. And I'm thinking, yep, that's because I poisoned myself uh, with Epsom salt. And he said, but you also have a bowel obstruction is what's going on. And I'm like, okay, what's that? You know, and I'm freaking out and I'm like, so what do we do? And he's like, well, we're going to have you transported to UT. 
And remember, they gave me all that blood when I was in the hospital. So when they took my blood at this hospital, it was all over the place and my levels were all over the place. And the nurse came out and she's like, did you just recently get blood or something? Because your blood levels are off the chain right now. I said, yes, I just got stabbed last week and almost killed and all this stuff. And she said, okay, I just wanted to make sure because I was a little freaked out. And I thought that's pretty funny. Um, but my grandmother and my aunt come up to the hospital and my friend goes home and they take me to UT and the doctor explains to me that he's gonna have to put a tube down my throat because the only other way to fix this bowel obstruction, which is when there's so much scar tissue that you can't go to the restroom. And I'd been throwing up and throwing up and throwing up. I mean, I couldn't anymore, you know? and. The way that they fix this is they either open you back up and they get rid of the scar, scar tissue or fix that, cut through it, or they put a tube in your nose and down your throat to suction out all the bio in your stomach so that you'll quit throwing up. So, <laughs> they do that, and I'm in the hospital for about two or three days. And... I was just miserable. Uh, my stomach was blowed up, and at these moments, I was very angry. This is when I was extremely angry. I was grieving my dad, angry about my situation, don't know who to trust, don't know who, who or what I'm going to do at this point. Um, my whole life's turned upside down. And I finally get to go home and go back to my grandmother's, and I'm getting better and I receive a message that says David respectfully would like to know if you would like to talk and I'm thinking to myself this is when I knew that PTSD was real instantly I go into thought blood or freeze and I start panicking and I my aunt and my cousins are in from out of state and I tell my aunt about it and she reaches out to this person who had sent this message and she said, my nephew will not be talking to him or reaching out to him. There's an order of protection, which come to find out there wasn't an order of protection, but that's what I was told. I'm not sure why I was told that. I guess somebody thought there was one, but there wasn't. And so that's the second time that David's tried to make contact with me during this. And it completely blew my mind because what do you have left to say? What do you have left to say? You know, what is there left to say? If I had done that to my significant other, I, I, would, I wouldn't know what to say or do, you know? So, with that being said, now, where are we at? Well, we have a preliminary hearing and the DA and the detective tells me my medical file alone was 1,200 pages and he had read it front to back. And both of them were fighting for me. They were, you know, they said, we're gonna be here the whole time. And with that being said, we go to court, um, and this is just a few couple weeks ago we go to court and this is the first time i have to see david and they want me to get on the stand and they want to question me and they in the whole nine yards so i'm good I'm, i've prepared myself we've done a pre-trial or a um a pre-trial i think is what it is where uh they, the DA met me at the courthouse and kind of showed me how everything would be set up and we went over what we were gonna be asked and all that good junk. Um, and so at this point, I was like, okay, I'm good. And I walk in the courtroom and before we had went in, David's parents and sister had walked by and then I go in and my, sister and friends are there and family friends um and the detective 
my biggest concern was where I would be sitting and if David could get to me in the courtroom because I didn't want him to get angry and fly mad and come after me or hurt me while I'm in the courtroom or anything like that. So David's chairs are right here. Let's show you like this. David's chair is right here and I'm sitting right here, right behind him. And the detective is between us, which he had told me, he said, loud enough for David to hear and everyone to hear, I'm sitting right here and I promise you, you will be okay. Nothing will happen. And he was very sweet and he was talking to me and just trying to make sure that I was calm. And I felt good, I felt like okay, and I was the first one that they called to the stand. So they called me to the stand and they start questioning me. And I choke up for a moment because I look over and I lock eyes with David and I can see him and, and it's all real. It's real now. And that same day, you know, I, my divorce papers were given to him and everything was just real at that moment. You know, it all came together and it was like, wow. And they, this did happen on video. It is on video, picture and sound. Maybe one day I will ask to have the video or to see it or, but I just haven't yet, you know. Um, and so they were supposed to play the video in court, but they didn't because the judge said, I don't need to see the video to know that you tried to take this man's off. You did, and I will bound it over. So it did get bound over. And so court's not over, it's just beginning because if they offer a plea deal and David says no, then we have to continue to go to court and go to trial and do all this stuff. and. They're just trying to space it out and give me time to get it together and be prepared. Even though I did so well at court the first time, you never know where a person's gonna be five years from now or two years from now or three years from now. And it's really scary because I thought I was good to go all together. I thought it'd be great. And I get up there and I choke because I immediately, everything hits me at once. And I think that's how a lot of this really happens through this healing process is a lot of times I feel great until it's that moment that I don't and I'm triggered and I'm scared and I'm hurt and I'm afraid and I'm angry and I'm lonely and I'm tired and I'm exhausted and, and people I feel like they don't understand and sometimes I feel like they do understand and sometimes I have to ask myself, how do they understand? How could they? Because sometimes just getting up and going to work takes everything out of me. Sometimes just getting up and doing my school takes everything out of me. Sometimes just getting up and making myself eat takes out it takes a lot out of me. You know, it, it beats me down. I I just have to say, you know, it's my higher power that's got me through this, and the support from my fan, friends and family and loved ones. And and I'm not perfect, and I fall all the time. And some days I'm stronger than others, you know. And sometimes I can be there for people and fill their cup. And sometimes I feel like I'm got maybe this much in mind, and I can't. There's been so much change and there's a lot of healing to come and I hope to, to continue these videos and, and uh, just help others along the way, you know? And so if you guys or anybody you know has a story and you would like to meet and do a video, I'd love to do it and spread awareness. Um, I'm in lots of support groups. I have lots of connections. I'm still in A or in A. I still do things like that. Um, and I will continue to be the voice for these people who are silenced and scared and, and to speak up because domestic violence isn't okay. And it's something that I continued to let go on and go on and go on and go on and go on until it about took my life. And that's not okay. You know, love you enough to say no more because it may be just a smack around here and there. It might be a grab, it might be money control, it might be time control, it might be closing you off, putting you in a box, it might be screaming, it might be yelling, it might be, well, he just yells, he doesn't put his hands on me, he doesn't, does he punch the walls? Is he violent in any way? Be on the lookout for that stuff because all, that, all of those things are abuse. Are they manipulative? Are they narcissistic? Are they, you know, are they, are they emotionally available? Ask that, you know, 
be vigilant. We keep what we have only with vigilance. One of my favorite readings in MA. So right now we're waiting on another court date. And I have an app on my phone that tells me every move that is made or change that's made with David. You know, and the DA and the detective are very good with me. They reach out, they check on me. I couldn't, I couldn't be more grateful. Guys, I guess that's all for today. Here's to part two. Like, comment, share. Please, 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 please. And if you need help, reach out. I love you guys. Until next time, peace out. Here's to part two of The Untold Truth.